So in addition to all of the questions around what the proposed technologies would actually come into being as and what they would do, which are crucial and which I think that we know awfully little about given the state of the modeling at this point, there are a whole other set of uncertainties around how these things could or couldn't be governed and how society would respond to them, how society would respond even to the prospect of them. And the really difficult thing about all of these categories is that it's unclear how much you can say about them in advance, and that's a real problem. So the, the technical way of putting that is that if you're talking about starting to deploy and doing a, you know, a small-scale study, um, you're talking about starting to do a small-scale study of something, um, if it's small-scale, do you get any information out that would actually help you decide whether or not it was a legitimate technique or a good idea? Socially speaking, similarly, you could think that well, we think we know how to talk about these in a way that will make it completely clear that we absolutely have to mitigate and have to adapt and have to do everything that we would do anyway. But it might be the case that if you develop even theoretical approaches to a certain point, that turns out not to be true from the social perspective. And it's very hard to anticipate that stuff. And uh, the governability, even, even if you were confident that the physical techniques could do what some people think they will do, and I'm not confident of that myself. The question about governability, will the society, will the you know, divided, complicated global society with class distinctions and national distinctions and different interests and incredibly complicated governance structures respond to these technologies in a way that involves, you know, that's fair and equitable and just and that respects humanitarian concerns and ecological concerns and so forth? It's very hard to tell, and I think that that's a deep problem, no matter what the technological approach is. Well, so to define it for a second, scenario planning generally uh, tries to say, rather than attempting to assess the probability of something happening, we'll consider all reasonable possibilities. So it deals with possibility, not probability. It's a narrative technique, typically, in which you actually ask people to come together and collectively imagine how things might play out in the future. And you're not saying that this is the future that will happen, this is the future that's most likely to happen, even this is a future that's reasonably likely to happen. You're saying, this is a future in which something happens that we need to think carefully about, because that bit of knowledge about how these things come together that's, that's narratively convincing, that makes intuitive sense, uh, gives us something that a model doesn't necessarily give. It lets us really explore the, the corners and the uncertainties and the surprises in a, in a way that's been useful in practical planning. It started as a business technique at Shell, um, and which given the multiple overlapping cascading uncertainties in the climate engineering field and the fact that those are happening within this already incredibly complex and robust problem of climate change, uh, scenario planning may be a technique that turns out to be very important in at least assessing what kind of governance questions or social questions, political, technological questions, really have to be answered before even basic research can go forward in some areas. We have a group called the Geoengineering Scenarios Working Group, and we started off doing fairly traditional scenario exercises. And we think they've been interesting, but Classical scenario planning has this problem. You get a bunch of people together and they have a lot of time to think about something that they've heard a lot about. And there may be cases in which, even though the point of the technique is to let you explore these far-flung possibilities, people talk each other out of interesting outcomes. And participatory approaches can be structured in different ways. For example, you can set up a game and you can say, the experience that we want you to have as a game player is one in which you're trying to win and your ideas about how things should work or how things do work in the real world are suspended for the moment because you're trying to play strategically. And if you're willing to commit to that, you can find yourself in a very interesting state where you're actually able to think thoughts that would be difficult for you to think otherwise. And then you can come out of that state, whether you win or lose, with a different understanding of how other people might think about the problem and maybe having discovered some things that really genuinely surprise you. 
There are also techniques that uh, some of us are starting to experiment with in this field and in climate generally that involve faster turnarounds. So for example, rather than giving people two days to mull over possibilities, you give them 30 seconds. You say, okay, well, what if this happens? And now what if this happens? And if you do that enough with enough people in enough different contexts on enough different questions, maybe that'll let us explore some of the corners and interactions in a way that surprises everybody, which is important in a conversation that runs the risk of following a few standard paths that were laid down years ago and which aren't necessarily going to lead us to the most productive and vital questions for this really deadly serious topic.